It's probably fair to say that Gradle has somewhat of a steep learning curve. And certainly compared to Maven, another popular build automation tool, it's more flexible and less opinionated about how things should work. So whether you've just made the jump into Gradle or have been using it for a while, in this video you'll discover seven things you'd wish you'd known about Gradle. With these pointers, you'll be well on your way to writing more powerful, more concise build scripts for your application, following best practice all the way. So let's get right into it. First up, the Gradle build script isn't as complex as it might seem. And the build.gradle can at first seem overwhelming, but it's helpful to understand that it consists of nothing but these components. Build script, here you can define additional dependencies of your build script. Plugins. Include plugins which add extra functionality to your build script. Repositories. Define where Gradle should fetch dependencies from. Configurations. Define how groups of dependencies interact with each other. Dependencies. Libraries that your application depends on for building or running. Task definitions. Any additional tasks that you want to define that haven't already been added by a plugin. Plugin configuration. Most plugins allow you to configure them with a specific configuration block. Additionally, since Gradle is written with Groovy, in theory it can contain any additional Groovy or Java code. This should be kept to a minimum with any extra functionality being extracted out into a plugin. Secondly, Gradle relies heavily on a few Groovy syntax features. For a Java developer, reading through a build.gradle file might make you feel that you're reading through some kind of definition syntax, maybe JSON or YAML. In reality, build.gradle files usually use some Groovy language features, which once explained, make things a lot easier to understand. Brackets are optional when calling methods. So as long as the method has at least one parameter, you can leave out the brackets. This means that we can have code like this in our build file. And this is in actual fact calling a method with signature public void set source compatibility. The getter setter method will be called automatically. Because Groovy will automatically call the setter and getter, we can simplify the previous example to the following which is more commonly found in build.gradle. Closures are supported. In Groovy, a closure is a block of code that can take arguments, return a value, and be passed around like a variable. This comes in really handy in our build.gradle as it allows us to write code like this. And the signature of the method being called here is in fact void repositories closure. So everything between the curly brackets is a closure and can in fact contain any code we want. With the knowledge of these three language features, it becomes easier to see that Gradle build scripts appear as a DSL, domain specific language, by making the most of the groovy syntax. Thirdly, Gradle uses its own cache for dependencies. Gradle can easily resolve dependencies from three popular repository locations using this syntax. And this is pulling from Maven Central, JCenter, and Google. And Gradle will try to resolve any declared dependencies from these locations in the order in which they're defined. Once it's fetched them, it will put it in its own cache, which is by default located in the user home directory slash dot gradle slash caches. The fourth point here is that Gradle can publish to Maven's local cache. And any Maven users know that Maven uses a cache located in the home directory slash dot m2 slash repository. By default, Gradle has nothing to do with this. You may, however, want to use this location for interoperability with any Maven projects you have, or to pull an artifact published by project A into project B before pushing to a central repository. 
Add Maven Local as a repository with this definition in your build doc Gradle. Now Gradle will try to resolve any dependencies from the local Maven cache. To push to this location, you'll also need to add the Maven Publish plugin. And then run dot slash Gradle W publish to Maven Local. You can double check your home directory slash dot m2 slash repository to make sure that it's being published correctly. The fifth point is you should always use a Gradle wrapper to execute tasks in a project. And one problem that Maven developers may have encountered is inconsistent Maven versions between developers working on a project. And Gradle completely removes this problem by introducing the Gradle wrapper. And the Gradle wrapper is a script that gets committed into your repository, meaning that whoever builds your project doesn't need a local version of Gradle installed, and whoever builds your project will always be using the same version of Gradle as everyone else. To set up the Gradle wrapper, you'll need a version of Gradle installed on your machine, then just run Gradle wrapper. You can also update the version of Gradle, which the wrapper uses, using Gradle wrapper dash dash Gradle version. Easy. It's then very important to ensure anyone building a project does so using the wrapper, i.e. run dot slash Gradle W and then the task name or on Windows, gradle.w.bat, and then the task name. The sixth point is that Gradle has a way to convert a Maven project to Gradle. And time needn't be a barrier to changing your Maven project to Gradle, because it includes a way to convert all your pom.xml files to build.gradle files, and any defined repositories, dependencies, and uses of the Maven published Java or war plugins will be converted. Sadly though, other plugins will have to be converted by hand. So just run Gradle in it. You'll now be able to benefit from Gradle's claimed 2 to 10 times build time speed improvements. It even works on multi-module projects. So check out the docs linked in the description below for full details. My seventh and last point is that multi-module is easy with Gradle. Setting up a multi-module project with Gradle is straightforward and flexible because all you have to do is add a definition for it to settings.xml, the file in your root project. For example, if you want to create a database submodule in a customer service project, the settings.gradle file will look like this. The surprising thing here is that you don't even need an additional directory or build.gradle file for this to work. Although you can if you want, if you have specific configuration for your submodule. To prove this works, I can now add this code to my build.gradle. And this defines a task hello in both the parent module and the database submodule. The definition of the task is a closure, i.e. an executable block of code, that prints out the project name. Now, if we run dot slash Gradle W hello, we see the following output. As you can see, it's printed out the names of the modules, proving that the multi-module structure works. By default, when you execute a task, Gradle will execute it on all modules that have that task. For more advanced features, check out the docs on this topic linked in the description below. So these were seven things that I wish I'd learned about Gradle from the beginning, as they would have made life a lot easier and the learning process a lot quicker. And if you didn't know some of these, make sure to tell your mum. And the best place to start for more information on any of these topics is the Gradle documentation at gradle.org. If you have any other tips along the same lines, please feel free to share them below, and maybe I'll include them in a part two of this video. So thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe. Otherwise, I'll see you next time on Tom Gregory Tech.